The Dartmouth-Hitchcock Heart and Vascular Center provides state-of-the-art services in clinical cardiology, advancing frontiers of knowledge in cardiovascular medicine, and training the next generation of heart and vascular experts. February is Heart Month, and Dartmouth-Hitchcock wants you to know about your heart health. This is the first in a series of podcasts called Get Heart Smart. Dr. Megan Coilwright, Interventional Cardiologist and Associate Director of the Structural Heart Disease Program and Assistant Professor at Dartmouth Skysel School of Medicine and at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy, is here with us today to discuss valve disease and shared decision making. Dr. Coilwright, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We understand you treat narrowed arteries and weakened heart valves. These are often caused by coronary artery disease, heart valve disease, or peripheral vascular disease. Today, we'll focus on heart valve disease, which involves heart valves that are not working correctly to regulate the flow of blood through the heart chambers. Can you describe why the valves might not work correctly? There are four valves in the heart that help the blood move in and out of the heart. And over time, as we age, these valves can become either too tight, where it's hard for blood to get through, or they can become very leaky. So certainly, aging is one of the big risk factors for heart valve disease. And as we see our population increase in terms of length of life, then the prevalence or how frequently we see these valve problems increases over time. Some of the other risk factors for heart valve disease are the same risk factors for heart attack and atherosclerotic disease. So high blood pressure over time as well as high cholesterol can also be risk factors for heart valve disease. In addition, more rarely, uh, folks may have a history of rheumatic heart disease, and that is also a risk factor for both leaky valves and valves that are tight. And the symptoms of valve disease can be symptoms that people will interpret as normal signs of aging when, in fact, they're due to a problem that could be fixed. Those symptoms of valve disease include things like fatigue, low energy, not being able to do the work that folks have liked to do in the past. Sometimes people will notice, for example, an inability to make the bed like they've done previously. They become more short of breath with some of the simple activities. For other patients that are very highly active, they'll notice that they can't do the same kind of climbing of a mountain, for example, or running on a treadmill, or even hustling within the supermarket. So the symptoms of valve disease should certainly not be misinterpreted as normal signs of aging. Valve disease can lead to things like fatigue, low energy, and shortness of breath, and if identified early, people can have near return to their previous level of functioning. That's interesting. Can you describe the symptoms of valve disease? Valve disease is typically picked up in the primary care provider's office first, and patients will often hear that their doctor says, you have a murmur. Many folks don't know what a murmur means. A murmur is a sound of blood moving through the heart and it's louder than normal sounds because either the valve is tight and the, the blood is moving through a very small opening or the valve is leaking and so there's a large amount of blood that's moving backwards. So first, the diagnosis is made oftentimes in the primary care doctor's office. After a murmur is heard or if there's no murmur heard, symptoms are identified of fatigue, low energy, or shortness of breath, a patient will often be referred for a first test that is non-invasive called an echocardiogram. This is an ultrasound of the heart, and with ultrasound waves, we're able to see the valves themselves to look to see if they are diseased. It's a very good screening test. Once a valve problem is identified by an echocardiogram, patients are usually referred to a cardiologist, a heart specialist, and there are many different types of cardiologists. As the field becomes more uh, advanced in terms of what type of cutting-edge therapies we can offer, we have uh, specialists in general cardiology as well as in heart valve disease, in intervention of that valve disease. And so usually people are first set up with a general cardiologist who can decide whether there is a therapeutic option that's reasonable for them, and if so, whether it would be best that they be offered open-heart surgery, which is our traditional gold standard, or whether they could be offered more of a minimally invasive approach through a transcatheter option. And we can talk more about the differences between those two. But the bottom line is the diagnosis is often made early in primary care. An ultrasound of the heart called an echocardiogram can help identify whether valve disease is truly present. And then patients are referred to a cardiologist, a heart specialist. Okay. Dartmouth-Hitchcock participates in shared decision-making with their patients. 
Can you describe that and how you would involve a patient after the diagnosis to be involved in the next steps? So when a patient comes to a subspecialist, there are more choices than ever before. And what we've worked to identify over the last decade is how we can best include patients in those decisions. Sometimes in medicine, there's one right answer for a medical problem. That's not the case for valvular heart disease. There are many different types of choices that are available, and they have different trade-offs. The risks and benefits differ, and thus they are important that they are informed by values and preferences of the patient. And so we focus here at Dartmouth on research in this field of shared decision-making, where we identify what are best practices for engaging patients in this decision. Certainly, patients do not want to feel like the entire decision is left to them, and that is not the focus of shared decision-making. The physician is the expert in the disease itself and in the choices that are available to the patient and what the risks and benefits are for that patient specifically. And we continue to provide that expertise. The patient, however, also has expertise, and theirs is in their values and preferences around the different choices available to them. And so it's important that we invite patients to share that during the clinical visit. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that we offer patients the full range of procedures available for their heart valve treatment, but that we make sure that that choice is right for them. The most common forms of heart valve disease are aortic valve stenosis and mitral valve regurgitation. Give us some detail about the differences in those diseases. As I mentioned, there are four heart valves in the heart, and they serve as doors to let blood come in and out of the heart. But there are two valves that give us the most problem as we age. The first is the aortic valve, and that's the valve that is the last stop in the heart before the blood goes out to the rest of the body. That valve tends to get tight over time, and it's called aortic valve stenosis. The risk factors for that are the same risk factors that lead to hardening of the arteries, so it's very common. In fact, one in 10 people, as they uh, reach the later stages of life in their 70s or 80s, have aortic valve stenosis. It's very common, and sometimes it can be missed in its early stages. The treatment for aortic valve stenosis is valve replacement. We don't have a medication, unfortunately, that prevents it or makes it go away once we identify it. It's a mechanical problem, and it requires a solution where we change the valve itself. The second kind of heart valve disease that is very common is mitral valve regurgitation. Now, this is one of the other four valves in the heart, and this valve, when we say regurgitation, we mean that it's leaking. It's much more common for this valve to be leaky than to be tight. And this type of valve problem actually occurs earlier in life. Aortic valve stenosis traditionally is when people are in their 70s or 80s, Mitral valve regurgitation can happen as early as 40s, 50s, or 60s. Currently, the biggest public health problem in mitral valve regurgitation is that patients who need that procedure, which is surgery, are not being identified early. We've actually found out that patients who have no symptoms and have mitral valve regurgitation benefit from early surgical repair. And Dartmouth-Hitchcock is a leader in mitral valve repair. So this is a disease process that we're trying to educate primary care physicians as well as the general public about identifying early because we can have a big impact on future uh, patient outcomes if we treat this early. Dr. Coyle Wright, thank you very much for joining us today and providing heart-healthy tips and information on valve disease. Thank you for having me. It's very important to us at Dartmouth that we ensure that patients have early treatment for their valve disease, and I appreciate the opportunity to spread the message about that. For more information or to attend a Get Heart Smart event in your area, please visit d-h.org slash heartsmart. Thanks for listening.